Let me welcome all of you on this rainy day uh, to uh, what we hope will be a, an enlightening session at the Institute, um, an afternoon conference on what I think is fair to say is one of the hottest issues facing the world economy these days, the issue of global financial flows after the Great Recession. Um, and sometimes in the past, the issue has been a paucity of financial flows to emerging markets. And now a lot of people in a lot of countries would say the problem is the opposite, a surfeit of capital flows to emerging markets uh, with policy considerations to be determined in light thereof. Uh, we thought it would be very useful and interesting to have a session that looked at these issues in some depth. And we're delighted to partner in this event with our friends at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, some of you know, because you were here before, we did an earlier event with them uh, last year on the dollar, the international monetary system, and all that. And uh, we selected this topic as one that we hoped would be germane this time around, and uh, uh, at least at the moment, uh, looks like it will be. So uh, before I come back to kind of lead off the discussion uh, and introduce the first panel, let me first bring up to the platform uh, William J. Wansley, the senior fellow at Booz Allen, who has worked with us in putting the project together, and we'll say a few words of welcome from our co-host. Go. Well, good afternoon. Let me also echo Fred's comments. Appreciate everyone making it through the rain and the parking and whatever it takes to get to the side of DC this time of day. Um, I am Bill Wansley. I'm the senior vice president of Booz Allen Hamilton. And I'm particularly pleased to be here uh, to work with Peterson on our second set of series of conferences we hope will continue. Uh, we always enjoy working with Fred and the team and hope, hope well, we can continue this relationship for the long term. So briefly, for those of you here today who don't know Booz Allen, I'm going to try to just take a couple minutes to set the stage for our discussions today and uh, let you know why we're here. For more than 97 years, Booz Allen Hamilton has been a leading of, uh, provider of consulting services to, to the government, uh, nonprofits, and to commercial industry. Uh, we partner with our clients wherever possible to try to find the best solutions to move forward in, uh, in their ideals. And we believe working with institutions like Peterson help us show that we are still interested in working with uh, nonprofits to advance whatever we can in terms of uh, global development. I'm actually a retired Army officer, and since I left the Army about 13 years ago, came to Booz Allen, I've really been fortunate to work with our U.S. government consulting arm in the intelligence community space. And not surprisingly, my experience there was associated with helping the government use financial transactions to identify terrorists and to help uh, provide security for this country. Uh, more recently, I've been asked to shift this, my focus uh, within Booz Allen to the financial services industry because we believe some of the processes that we've developed and abilities to find money laundering and illicit finance and understanding some of the global flows of money as we're about to talk to today can be useful for the public sector. So today, let me frame a couple questions if I can. I uh, was really fortunate this week to have one of our Booz Allen colleagues, uh, Mohamed Gohar, um, who also works with me in this, this new business of helping banks uh, just returned from Egypt. He's a, he's a native-born Egyptian, and he came back to us to say that he's never seen such excitement uh, in his country, and that he wanted me to know that commerce was flowing, the banks were open, the institutions were alive, and that he believed that the Egyptian government ended up becoming and demonstrating that they were far more resilient as an institution that we may have expected. And in fact, I, we might suggest that Egypt, Egypt in some ways could be a role model for the rest of the turbulence of the Middle East right now as their institutions hopefully will stabilize the environment and allow for a, a peaceful political and economic transformation in the near future. So with that in mind, I thought we'd kind of think of what are the kind of questions we should be looking at today. Um, we, we need to know how the changes in the, perhaps the flows around the world will be affected by what's happening in Northern Africa right now and in the Middle East and the contiguous area. We need to think about what we can do to stimulate and make sure that the, there is resiliency in those national institutions that will allow foreign investment in those countries and further development. 
So as we have our speakers come up and our panelists today, I think we should challenge them to help us think through these problems and see what we can do to help them move forward. Uh, I want to mention that my colleague David Rubin, who's also a senior vice president of Buzan, will be doing the hard work today and summarizing what we're doing at the end of the day and thanking you all. Uh, let me first give you my, uh, again, personal thanks for joining us today, and I look forward to a very uh, enjoyable discussion. Thank you. Okay, let me just very succinctly, I hope, set the uh, stage for the conference and uh, frame the issues that we want to talk about. Um, as I mentioned before, capital flows to emerging markets have been a hot topic for a long time, but the focus of that discussion has changed quite uh, dramatically from time to time. One issue that is constantly in the context is the volatility of those capital flows. Huge flows in one direction, then maybe huge reflows out, in and out, boom and bust phenomenon. That question remains very, very large, whether we're on the upswing of the cycle, as now is the case, or as we've been on the downside of the cycle, and not so many years ago, for people to remember. So that is clearly one key topic, and how that volatility affects both the countries that receive and subsequently lose the flows, but also, of course, for the investors and for the markets in general. Um, in fact, that volatility and the huge swings have led to a uh, renewed debate over the costs and benefits of financial globalization and the uh, wisdom, or lack thereof, some would argue, for emerging markets and developing countries opening themselves to international capital flows. And that will be one of our uh, main topics today. Uh, Bill Klein has done a, uh, a really uh, major work uh, a, a substantial book sub, um, summarizing the vast literature in this issue and presenting some new analyses of the costs and benefits of capital flows to emerging markets that he will be presenting to the group this afternoon. Uh, part of the question is the traditional issue of how emerging and particularly developing countries can attract inflows of private capital in order to augment their growth, finance their current account deficits if they have them. Um, and so that remains an important part of the issue, at least for a large part of the world, including Africa, that we will pay particular attention to in our second panel of the day. Um, but at the same time, as I alluded to already, there are renewed doubts and anxieties uh, about countries relying heavily on inflows of foreign capital. Uh, part of that is simply the uh, uh, accept acceptance of high degrees of risk. Uh, you live by the jump shot, you die by the jump shot. Uh, a lot of money comes in, the money may go back out, and you may therefore be in the soup just at the wrong time. And that continues to be a key concern. But now, particularly in the big, rapidly growing emerging markets, the issue is whether it's too much of a good thing. Uh, huge inflows of capital, creating upward pressure on exchange rates, um, expansionary pressure on money supplies and uh, uh, financial conditions within countries that may be inappropriate, uh, as in a number of emerging markets now they feel, if they are already growing rapidly, facing inflation risks, facing the risk of new asset bubbles, uh, do they want to undertake measures to resist those inflows of capital in order to limit their exposure to that range of problems? So that now also becomes a very uh, uh, critical uh, range of issues. Um, that set of concerns has renewed interest in the issue of capital controls, or at least taxes on inward flows of foreign investment. Um, a number of countries are now experimenting with that, others are considering it, and that too I think is an important topic for our discussion today. Uh, the IMF, which in the past some would say has had a fairly doctrinaire view about uh, keeping capital markets open and avoiding capital controls and now expresses a bit more nuanced and uh, uh, balanced, some would say, views on the topic, uh, i.e. a little more open mind about it. So um, the goal today is to discuss all that, attempt to foresee what is likely to ensue both in terms of the capital flows themselves and in terms of policy reactions to them.
uh, particularly in host countries receiving the money, but also in home countries from which the capital comes, and in the financial markets uh, more broadly, thinking of regulatory policies in order to minimize the risks of generating or exacerbating financial instability in, uh, in both sets of countries. So uh, that's the backdrop. Uh, we've got a full and I think exciting program for the day. We've divided it into two panels. The first panel will talk about the uh, uh, actual flows to emerging markets, uh, meaning the higher income, rapidly growing BRICS and others uh, of the world. The second panel will then turn to the lesser developed countries, uh, particularly with a focus on Africa, with some uh, speakers who have direct involvement in investment in Africa itself, and will bring us a number, I think, of very rich lessons from their own experience. Uh, the first panel will have four speakers to lead off. The first is Jeremy Lawson from the Institute of International Finance. I'm sure you all know that, led by Charles Delara, uh, is the International Association of all the world's big financial institutions. They have a very uh, high-powered and, I think, uh, extremely competent uh, economics unit. Bill Klein took a leave from here for a number of years to head it up and get it organized. And then, thankfully for us, he came back to us. Uh, but he left in his legacy a very uh, uh, high-powered group at the IIF. Uh, Jeremy Lawson is now the deputy director of its global macroecon uh, uh, macroeconomic analysis department. And he will present to us their outlook for financial flows to the emerging markets. Uh, IIF, I think it's fair to say, is known globally as the kind of gold standard of that kind of analysis. People use their numbers in uh, uh, most discussions of where the capital flows to emerging markets are likely to go. Um, Jeremy uh, had worked at the OECD as a senior economist before joining the IIF. He would spent a number of years at the Reserve Bank of Australia, from whence he comes prior to that, uh, and brings a wealth of experience to the topic. Uh, Bill Klein will then talk, as I mentioned already, about the pros and cons of financial globalization what it means for growth in developing and emerging markets, and what the risks as well as the benefits are. Um, Bill's a senior fellow here at the Institute, as most of you know, he's been with us since the outset of the Institute, now almost 30 years ago. Um, he was on leave for a while as Deputy Managing Director at the IIF, uh, but here has done a series of really seminal books on trade issues, climate change issues, global imbalances issues, and uh, international capital markets, of which this is the latest and I think most extensive example. Uh, our third panelist will be J.W. Rust um, from Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, J.W. Uh, leads the Civil and Commercial Financial Services Group there at Booz Allen. Uh, he works on regulatory design, stress testing of banks, financial sector reform, due diligence, a lot of the issues that relate directly to the market component of the capital flows, and so he will complement the more policy-oriented side and the macroeconomic side that Jeremy and Bill will have talked about. Then finally, our discussant of all of the above will be Kristen Forbes. Um, Kristen is Jerome and Dorothy Lemelson, Professor of Management and Global Economics at the Sloan School of Management at MIT. Uh, she was previously a member of the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House in the previous administration, 2003 to 2005. She's currently a member of the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors for the state of Massachusetts. Um, before she was in the White House, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, she's Vice Chair of the Advisory Board of the Peterson Institute, uh, and so we have a particular place in our hearts for Krista. So, thanks to all of you. Uh, we will start the uh, presentations, and I will ask Jeremy to lead it off. Okay, how do I flip through to the start of my presentation? Sorry. Just down the down arrow. Down the down arrow? Okay, just. Great. Okay, um, thank you, everybody. Um, so, Obviously, I'm, I'm from the Institute of International Finance. Uh, in January, we published uh, our sort of most recent update uh, 
of our capital flow estimates and projections for 2010, 2011 and 2012. So just the purpose of this presentation is, is, to, is to run through some of those numbers in a general form and then some of the policy issues that we, uh, uh, that we see as sort of being you know, important for shaping that, uh, that outlook. I'm going to try and sort of be relatively brief so that we can enlarge the time for, for discussion afterwards. Um, so, uh, so this is a this is the first chart, uh, which uh, provides a summary of our of our estimates for private capital inflows to emerging markets. Um, so, in 2010, uh, the, the the key point is that uh, cap private capital flows uh, rebounded strongly uh, after falling in 2008 and 2009. Um, uh, capital flows uh, increased to you know to to all regions uh, during that period. Um, uh, we have, uh, you know, in China, um, private capital inflows that sort have of reached a new record in absolute levels uh, in, in, in 2010. Um, uh, one thing one always has to be a little bit careful when interpreting these numbers uh, is that these are obviously a flow variable and not a stock variable. Uh, and, and because nominal GDP is obviously increasing quite rapidly in emerging markets, uh, even though, even though cap aggregate capital flows are at the sort of second highest level in history in 2010, according to our current estimate, uh, as a share of GDP, they're still considerably below the years leading up to the leading up to the uh, to the to the financial crisis. Uh, then, sort of going forward, uh, according to our current estimates, there's sort of just a gradual sort of pick up in flows uh, in 2011 uh, and 2012. And it's important to recognise that there's considerable uncertainty about sort of estimates of capital inflows. Uh, for example, if you looked at our estimates at the beginning, say in January 2010, of what flows would be uh, in, in, in 2010, there are about 180 billion less uh, than we currently estimate them to be in 2010. There's also been a tendency for capital inflows to be underestimated uh, over, over time. So if you look at the, uh, the period before the financial crisis, uh, in nearly every year, not just us but other forecasters of flows, tended to under forecast. Uh, well, growth in emerging markets, first of all, uh, and then there's quite a high correlation between capital flows and, and, and emerging market growth, uh, and so capital flows as well. So it's important to bear that in mind going forward. Uh, the next chart just gives a uh, disaggregation of those flows into, into the important components. So foreign direct investment, uh, non-bank lending, which is largely sort of portfolio debt, uh, portfolio equity and bank lending. And well, one thing that's sort of fairly clear is that some components of flows, as everybody knows, are more volatile than others. Uh, in particular, portfolio equity and bank lending tend to be relatively volatile. You can see sort of quite clearly there was a, a you know, ma massive growth in, in, in bank lending uh, to emerging markets uh, in, in the run-up to the financial crisis, with a fairly large proportion of that uh, uh, actually representing lending into emerging Europe, uh, so countries like Hungary and Slovenia and Poland and, uh, and, and the like. Uh, and that quickly reversed during the crisis. Uh, in terms of 2010, probably the most notable uh, feature of why the, why the estimates have been rev revised up is that there's been a recovery in bank lending uh, into emerging markets. Uh, I mean, part of that is obviously this is a, the strong growth in emerging markets uh, over the past 12 months, but also the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the broader sort of growth and, uh, and ample global liquidity that's, that's floating around, some of which has been finding its way into emerging markets. Um, so the next, um, actually, I'll, I'll skip forward because uh, it got placed in the wrong uh, in the wrong spot in the presentation. Um, obviously, the, those numbers are a little bit backward looking uh, in the sense that they sort of reflect sort of more of the official numbers that we had, you know, as per the beginning of the year. But one thing that's been clear from the more uh, the more timely sort of indicators of flows is that the beginning of 2011 has seen somewhat of a reversal uh, in in portfolio. Uh, debt and equity uh, equity flows. So if that's actually maintained um, for, for much longer. I've seen some evidence that maybe it started to turn around in March, but we'll see as this sort of data gets updated uh, that the 2011 could actually turn out to be weaker uh, than, than we're currently estimating if, if that would have been maintained. So it's just something important to keep in mind as uh, as we go forward. So I'll just switch back. Oops, sorry, uh, wrong way. <laughs> 
So obviously, uh, in, the, in the literature discussing sort of flows, uh, you know, there's an emphasis on the push and pull factors that, that drive those inflows. Uh, and so, you know, in, in the report, which you know, which hopefully some of you have have read and received, we discuss some of those sort of flows and whether they're supporting, you know, how they're likely to support flows going forward. So obviously, a, a, an, an important one uh, is is the rate of uh, of economic growth in emerging markets. Uh, so you can see that there's a fairly sort of tight sort of positive correlation. Um, uh, this is obviously just a bivariate correlation, but but it's there nonetheless between you know emerging market real GDP growth, uh, net private capital inflows to emerging markets. And so our current forecasts are for emerging market growth in 2011, 2012 to remain quite solid around about the six percent mark. Uh, it's a little bit of a moderation from from sort of the from the very rapid growth that was sort of seen as, as countries emerge from the crisis, but it's still quite solid. So it provides a, pla a strong platform for flows going forward. Another sort of longer run sort of structural issue is that uh, uh, because of the, the strong rate of economic convergence that's currently um, uh, sort of going on between certain emerging markets uh, and the mature economies, uh, you know, their, their share of global output uh, is, is increasing quite significantly over time. Uh, and if you, if you look at the data, you find that if you look at the weight of emerging markets in sort of global portfolio, investor portfolios, you know, you could argue that they're underweight relative to their share of, the, of, of global output. And so uh, another, uh, another factor shaping our view is that we think that over time, uh, as emerging market assets become sort of more mainstream, if you like, and there's maybe a more of a reflection that the improved institutional and macro environment makes, makes emerging market assets that maybe a slightly less riskier asset class than they were seen in the past, uh, that we can expect uh, you know, a, secular, a secular upward trend uh, in, in flows that are just related to that catch-up process. So that's another factor you know, to think about going forward. You know, at the same time, you know, emerging market assets are a risk, uh, are, are still sort of a riskier sort of asset class. And so you can see quite clearly that you know, when the financial crisis hit, uh, even though arguably growth prospects in a lot of emerging markets remain quite solid, you know, there was quite a reversal in capital inflows. And so, so that's something also to keep, you know, the more bearish you are about global growth, if you like, and whether there are some shocks that you know, we might see in the future, you know, whether that be related to sovereign debt crises in the mature world, um, uh, or, or, or some other factor uh, that, that flows will be volatile for those sorts of reasons. And of course, it's very difficult to forecast that, and that's not built into our current projections, but we would see that as, as a risk factor going forward. Um, then now I'll just quickly talk about some, some of the policy issues, which is obviously a very sort of vexed issue at the moment. Uh, I know others are going to comment more, more, more about it. Um, I guess the, the, the point that we've been trying to make recently is that um, you can sort of see in the literature that there's probably a growing acceptance or that the intellectual consensus has been changing to sort of see you know, capital control measures and macro prudential measures in maybe a more favourable light than was previously the case. Uh, and you know, there's a range of analysis of supporting that. And whilst I, 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 we wouldn't dispute that there are circumstances in which you know, some types of capital controls might be appropriate, I mean, we think that it's important that you know, each measure, rather than getting into debates about you know, controls or no controls, that you know, each measure sort of be looked at you know, uh, individually sort of to try and understand whether it's addressing a particular risk and whether it's likely to do so efficiently. So that's, well, that's one issue. Um, you know, the second is that you know, we think that sort of measures that are aimed in the sense of a more macro prudential uh, dimension are likely to be more appropriate than, than, than other types of measures. And then the third point is to stress the complementarity of, of, of control measures with um, uh, with other sort of macro or macro policies, and that's where we see some concerns over the next sort of 12 months. So I'll just run through some graphs that highlight that. I mean, the the, the first is that uh, even though global imbalances, if you measure that by the you know by the gaps in current account deficits and surpluses across a number of key economies, I mean that they they have reduced. 
uh, you know, since 2007, uh, but they're still relatively wide. In fact, you know, according to some forecasts, Germany's current account surplus as a share of GDP could once again be 6% in 2011 and 2012. You know, the China surplus is, uh, you know, has fallen but still quite wide. You know, the US current account deficit could widen again in 2011. So it's just to say as a backdrop that global imbalances are still an issue. The, the crisis did not resolve those. Um, the, the second point is on, is on currencies, and there's obviously been a lot of discussion recently uh, about, the, uh, about the appreciation of certain you know, floating emerging market currencies, you know, like Brazil or Chile. And we want to draw attention to the fact that if you look maybe since the, since the start of the crisis or before the crisis hit, actually relatively few emerging markets have seen significant appreciation since the middle of 2008. For example, in Brazil's case, like, like actually Australia's case, they, there was a sharp depreciation in the wake of the crisis, and so a lot of the appreciation in recent times has been a recovery you know, to, to, to pre-crisis levels, and so that perspective uh, has to be maintained. Uh, you know, we also take the view uh, that, you know, again, although there is a debate about how much China's currency might be undervalued, that, that you know, allowing sort of more sort of real appreciation of yuan, you know, is, a, is an important part of sort of global, in, you know, rebalancing. And in fact, you know, if China doesn't take some moves in that regard, it actually makes it harder for other emerging markets, say in Latin America, you know, to manage, you know, to, to manage flows there. Uh, the, the other issue is, is monetary policy. Now, it's obviously sort of quite complicated. I mean, everybody here is you know, familiar with the policy trilemma uh, that the countries face, that, it's diff that, that if you have sort of three policy goals, one being a stable currency, one being, say, a relatively open sort of capital market, and another being sort of independent monetary policy, that you can't really pursue all three at once. Uh, and, and that dilemma is being faced by a lot of emerging markets at the moment. So we're just drawing one thing that we've been drawing attention to uh, is that uh, the real interest rate differential between mature economies and emerging market economies is very low at the moment. Uh, and that it, it, it's difficult to justify that in an environment in which, uh, in which capacity constraints are much more prevalent in emerging markets. Uh, and, and, and <coughs> growth and, and, and asset prices and credit developments. And so the, you know, the, the accommodative nature of monetary policy in, in, in a lot of emerging markets, despite some small moves recently, you know, does create risks. Uh, the other issue is fiscal policy, uh, which uh, often sort of falls off the radar, you know, in part because, uh, well, up until the crisis, there was sort of more of a view that fiscal policy, you know, should be aimed at sort of more medium-term developments. But, uh, but as this sort of graph highlights, most of the major emerging markets have fairly sizable you know, budget deficits at the moment and plans for fiscal consolidation are relatively limited at the moment. So we see there being more scope for fiscal policy uh, to make a contribution to, uh, you know, to, to cooling economies, in particular because it has the, you know, has the potential benefit of instead of putting upward pressure on, on, on long rates uh, in, in emerging markets and attracting sort of further capital flow it works in the other direction. So, so it would be a, you know, we'd be very pleased to see more action on the fiscal front. Uh, and this is just a chart um, you know, that we, we've taken from, um, um, from work that sort of Menzi Chin sort of done on, on sort of longer term trends in, uh, in financial openness. And this is just to point out that you know, there is a longer run trend to more openness across the global economy, uh, although the, you know, the trends do differ depending on which emerging market you're talking about. Uh, I mean, we, we generally sort of see that as being a you know, favourable development uh, and that if, you know, if, if controls start to you know, uh, become a much more prevalent part of the, the toolkit, the, then that sort of process of greater openness sort of could go into, we could go into reverse or decline a little bit. Uh, and, and in of itself, that's, that's not the issue, I, you know, just to come back to the point that, that, that we see just being important to make sure that measures that are used, in a sense, would pass a cost-benefit sort of analysis or a cost-benefit test, if you like. So, so just to wrap up, so our main message is that so the, the net inflows to emerging markets, you know, they're, they're, they'll be just under a trillion dollars in 2010, most likely, uh, and the flows, the flows could increase again in 2011, although that will depend on whether those shorter run developments are maintained. Uh, and that we've been upgrading our projections over time, and that upgrade is something that we generally have to do as you enter into an upswing in the uh, in the emerging market business cycle. 
Uh, and the rising flows are generally supported by strong emerging market growth, portfolio rebalancing, and, and the and abundant sort of global liquidity. Uh, and the emerging economies aggregate current account surpluses are projected to narrow over the next two years, but only by a smaller amount. And so strong private capital inflows do raise important policy challenges for emerging markets, and with nominal growth strong, there's considerable pressure for higher interest rates, but those higher rates do add, up, add to upward pressure on currencies uh, and, and capital flow. So it puts the, puts the onus on other policy measures to try and sort of, you know, to, to try and resolve that imbalance. So, so in response to those sorts of pressures, the, you know, policymakers have a number of options. They can keep interest rates down, they can impose capital controls, they can make more use of macroprudential instruments, tighten fiscal policy, uh, allow exchange rates to appreciate. You know, so that there are a variety of tools available and that we want to emphasise that we think that a combination of three, four and five are likely to be important first steps in the adjustment process with controlled measures, you know, a complement uh, in, in, in isolated sort of circumstances. Okay, so that's all I had to say. So thank you very much. Very good. The resurgence of capital flows to emerging markets and developing countries after the Great Recession has once again raised the question of whether financial openness or, quote, financial globalization is a good thing or a bad thing for these economies. My presentation will summarize the findings of my book on this subject, published by the Institute last year. The broad thrust of my study is that financial openness is positive for growth, so the burden of the proof should be on policy interventions that would curb financial globalization. The study is based on a critical survey of a large empirical literature that especially flourished after the East Asian crisis of 1998. Most economists view open markets in international trade as beneficial to economic growth. Economists are much more divided on whether financial openness is beneficial. Yet the same underlying forces apply to both. In trade, openness provides static gains from specialization and dynamic productivity gains. In finance, openness provides reallocation of capital from where it's abundant to where it is scarce, and hence a corresponding static gain, and technical change from direct investment, as well as from more efficient domestic financial sectors, spurs productivity growth. The principal question in finance has always been whether macroeconomic damages from sudden stops outweigh the secular gains from capital deepening and technical change. My broad conclusion is that financial openness is beneficial for growth even after taking account of costs from crises. Before turning to the empirical findings, it's first important to consider several broad analytical issues. A major challenge is whereas the metrics for trade openness are relatively straightforward, namely tariffs and non-tariff barriers, in finance they are much more ambiguous. The IMF compiles information on legal restrictions on capital openness that has been used by Quinn and others to provide a de jure index of openness. In contrast, de facto measures apply ratios of gross or net capital flows or stocks to GDP. Special care must be taken with especially de facto majors for small economies. For example, gross capital flows on the order of 200% of GDP took place in Ireland compared with only 13% of GDP in the United States. Yet there is no 
meaningful sense in which capital is more restricted in the United States than it was in Ireland. Theoretical expectations provide a benchmark for what might be expected magnitudes of growth effects from capital openness. In the neoclassical model, if the capital share is 40% of GDP and the capital output ratio is 2, then an emerging market economy might expect that a capital inflow of 5% of GDP would boost output by 1%. Studies on total factor productivity growth internationally tend to attribute about 1% annual growth to that source. So if financial openness were the source of perhaps a third of that productivity growth, then the total growth contribution from openness would be 1.3% per year for an emerging market economy. For an industrial country, the expectation would be lower because of less potential for capital deepening. For emerging market and developing countries, and some would argue for industrial countries, after the experience of 2007-2009, there is the additional consideration of how much openness boosts the risk of financial crisis. Endogeneity is a key empirical issue. If we observe faster growth in financially more open economies, which direction is the causation? This issue is partly addressed by the use of lags and such techniques as generalized method of moments. One key study by Edison and colleagues in 2002 found that using GMM techniques reduced the magnitude of the growth impact estimated, but only moderately, by one-fourth. Conceptually, endogeneity should be far less of a problem for the de jure measures than for the de facto, whereas actual flows would be expected to respond to growth performance seems highly unlikely that if policymakers thought that openness was a bad idea and had legal restrictions against it, that when they experienced years of growth, they would finally relinquish these restrictions as a sort of a luxury good. Finally, there is the econometric issue of how to treat non-significant results. Financial globalization is no exception to the practice of what I call econometric gotcha, in which one researcher introduces another variable and succeeds in turning a, a previous researcher's finding of a significant result into an insignificant result. Well, it turns out that in fields such as medicine, education, and psychology, there has been increasing use of metastatistical analysis in which all results are considered and weighted by the inverse variance of what is called the size effect, which is basically the size of the impact parameter normalized across the different specifications. And this gives even the insignificant results some weight uh, in the overall estimate. The contribution of Glass in 1976 uh, proposing the effect size to compare across differently specified studies uh, was an important development in this literature. Subsequently, Hedges and Olkin in 1985 uh, pointed out that the practice, which happens in economics all the time, of vote counting, saying that if there's only four significant results and six insignificant results, there's no effect, has the effect of, in, in, in their words, strongly, strongly biasing the results toward the conclusion that the treatment has no effect. So in short, it is not legitimate to simply count up the number of insignificant results, compare them to the significant results in order to get a considered view of what the overall body of empirical literature says. <laughs>
I have employed the meta-statistical analysis to obtain an alternative benchmark of the growth impact estimates from the literature. It turns out to be lower. And for at least the industrial countries, I consider this lower result to be the more plausible. My principal estimates focus on the results of what I consider to be the leading empirical studies on general financial openness impact on growth. The de jure studies here are marked with a J, and the de facto with an F. Typically, the study will conduct a cross-country test explaining growth with a set of widely accepted control variables, usually including per capita income to capture convergence, the rate of investment, some measure of macroeconomic stability, and or a measure of trade openness. This table translates the findings of the leading studies into a comparable metric, the change in annual percent growth <coughs> from moving toward complete closeness to complete openness. In the de jure studies, typically there is an index that goes from 0 to 100, so it's pretty clear what that amounts to. In the de facto studies, I've used the 10th and the 90th percentiles in the variable in question as the proxy for complete closeness and complete openness. When in addition to these nine studies, three other studies with thresholds effects, such as there's positive effects if you have uh, a low black market premium, when those are included, it turns out that only one half of one study out of a total of 12 studies has a significant negative sign on the effect of openness on growth. Well, if financial openness in fact had a zero effect on growth or a negative effect on growth, we would expect to see at least half of the statistically significant results have a negative sign. The fact that only one half out of 12 has a negative sign would mean that the odds are 300 to 1 against finding this result on a purely random basis. The average of the significant effects is that complete openness versus complete closedness boosts growth by 2% per year. When I apply the meta-statistical tests within studies, which can be done, of course, as well as across studies. And for example, it's important in the important 2007 IMF study, which had uh, a majority of its results showing insignificant results. So when I apply the meta-statistical within each study, uh, I find that the growth impact falls to 1.57% per year. When I further extend the meta-analysis to be not only within studies, but also across studies, this falls to 0.56% per year, the two lower right-hand entries in the table. So for me, the benchmark range of these results is that the growth impact of going from complete closure to complete openness is between 0.5% per year at the low end and 1.5% per year at the high end. I would say that the industrial countries should be expected to be toward the lower end of this range, again, because they do not have the same scope for further capital deepening. The predominant finding, then, is a relatively strong positive impact of openness. In contrast, the more popular view in the surveys of this literature is that the evidence is mixed, uh, although a, an important recent survey did say that it was moving toward, quote, finding positive marginal effects on growth. This is the Coase et al. IMF study in 2006. One influential study, which I think contributed to the skepticism about the growth impacts, was conducted uh, at the fund by Edison and others in 2004. 
What that study did uh, was to add a variable for, quote, government reputation and found that previously significant studies results turned insignificant when the government reputation variable is added. However, I show that the government reputation variable is significantly caused by growth rather than vice versa. And that should come as no surprise because the rating agencies in general tend to lag rather than lead. So I reject the finding of that study as demonstrating non-robustness of the earlier significant studies. There are also many studies of the influence of foreign direct investment on growth. Once again, one only sees positive coefficients in this table. If there were no influence, one would expect as many negative as positive significant results. In the case of the Karkovic-Levine study done for the Peterson Institute, the results included some insignificant findings. But when the metastatistical method is applied across the total of their 62 tests, the result is a still relatively strong positive growth impact. In the IMF study of 2007, direct investment was the variable that showed up most clearly as having a significant positive impact. There are also several studies conducted at the industry or even firm level. Once again, these show positive effects. Similarly, a smaller number of studies have been done on portfolio equity opening. And they tend to show, they do show positive results. Although Henry, 2007, suggests that these positive effects may be only a temporary adjustment, I show that using his parameters, the growth effects on the order of 1% per year would be expected to persist, persist for about two decades. The empirical studies thus tend to find positive effects of financial openness on growth generally and in category-specific tests. A key question, however, is whether increased vulnerability to crisis swamps these positive effects. One of the best empirical studies on this question by Tornell, Westerman, and Martinez in 2004 finds that extra volatility reduces growth by only a fraction of the increase from openness. Edwards, 2006, finds that although crises reduce growth, countries that restrict capital do not experience milder crises. Data from the Hutchison and Noy 2005 study on currency and banking crises show, in fact, that for 22 emerging market economies from 1975 to 1997, the incidence of crises was slightly lower rather than higher for countries with higher financial openness. In an effort to quantify the possible trade-off to credit risk, I constructed a simple calibrated model. In this equation, the annual growth effect of financial openness is the secular growth gain, the first right-hand side term, minus the expected growth loss during the year from increased crisis risk. The subscript C is for a currency crisis, B for a banking crisis. The expected loss is the rise in probability of crisis as a consequence of financial opening multiplied by the damage from the crisis multiplied by the general incidence of such a crisis. I take favorable and unfavorable parameters from the crisis literature, in particular Hutchison and Noy, Reinhardt and Reinhardt 2008, Reinhardt and Rogoff 2008. In the favorable case, the change in the probability of a crisis from financial openness is negative, as the previous slide suggested. With two sets of three parameters, there are 64 possible outcomes. Using 0.5% as the annual secular growth gain from going from complete closeness to complete openness, in other words, the metastatistical result, 
the net impact is negative in only three out of 64 cases. So the odds are 20 to one in favor of growth gains from financial openness outweighing expected losses from increased vulnerability to crises. An important question about crisis vulnerability is whether bank and bond debt might have a negative growth impact even if direct investment and portfolio equity have positive growth effects because debt is more vulnerable to sudden stops. In qualitative terms, the literature does tend to favor direct investment and portfolio equity and place bond and especially bank debt as more problematical. Certainly during the East Asian crisis, it was high short-term bank debt far in excess of reserves that proved to be highly dangerous. Curiously, although debt is the bet noir in some economists' doubts about financial openness, there are very few empirical studies on growth effects of this subcomponent of capital. My study carries out two tests on this question. The first examines whether there is an inverse U-shaped influence of financial openness on growth, with a positive phase associated with early liberalization of direct investment and portfolio equity, followed by a negative impact phase when debt capital is, in addition, liberalized. No such pattern is found. The second test is more direct. It regresses growth against the usual control variables and the ratio of external debt liabilities and assets to GDP. The debt variable has either a positive rather than negative significant impact on growth or if an outlier, particularly Hong Kong, is excluded, once again, no significant effect and once again indicating no special negative role for debt versus equity. My study then turns to quantifying the realized economic gains from financial openness over the past quarter century. First, it is necessary to track the path of actual openness. Using the Quinn measure, with industrial countries labeled as DC in the key, uh, the industrial countries have converged to a high degree of openness, 90 to 100 on this index, on the Quinn index. Developing countries have also become much more open, but have some ways to go, with the more open among them at an index of about 80, but the less open still at only about 50. I then apply, the, apply parameters from 11 empirical models to calculate what would have been the growth contribution from the amount of realized financial openness over time. Using the notion that this is a high variant estimate because it's from the uh, significant and intra-meta parameters rather than the inter-study meta parameters, the results are as shown in this figure. For industrial countries, the degree of financial openness was contributing about 0.6% to annual growth in the 70s, rising to about 1% by the most recent decade. For Latin America, there was a decline from the 70s to the debt crisis 80s, but then a rebound to about 0.5% by 95, 2004. Asian emerging market economies had a steadier contribution of about 0.5% per year. These gains can be accumulated to decompose the portion of present day output levels attributable to cumulative growth effects of realized financial openness over the past quarter century. It's also important to include a low variant based on the cross-study metastatistical result, namely one-third the size of the high variant, especially for industrial countries. The resulting estimate is that for industrial countries, about 8% of the current level of output is attributable to cumulative gains from financial openness in the low variant. For the United States, the figure is 8.8%. .8%. Close, 
to the 10% estimate found by Bradford, Grieco, and Huffbauer in their institute study on the contribution of trade openness. For developing countries, the low variant gives a more modest contribution of about 2% of present output. The high variant, about 6%, may have somewhat more relevance than in the case of industrial countries because of the greater potential for capital deepening. The lower range of the contribution for the developing countries uh, than for industrial countries is attributable to two factors. First of all, they have not liberalized as much as seen in the Quinn index trend. And secondly, their overall growth has been much faster from other sources, so the potential share that could be obtained from financial openness would be smaller. Finally, my study asks whether the global financial crisis of 2007-09 provides new evidence that would show greater dangers of financial openness than previously recognized. It turns out that the answer is no. There was no relationship between the severity of the decline in the growth rate from 2005-07 to 2008-10 on the one hand and the degree of financial openness on Quinn's measure on the other. Although the IMF did publish a staff position note in early 2010 that reported a significant negative effect on growth from openness during the crisis, I have shown that this report, that this result disappears if the Baltics are omitted. And the huge current account deficits of the Baltic states on the order of 15% of GDP had much more to do with exchange rate and fiscal policies and strategies than with financial openness. For the major emerging market economies, neither was there evidence of a negative impact of financial openness on relative stock market performance during the global financial crisis. The Great Recession thus did not change the basic case in favor of financial openness for emerging market economies. Today's conference revisits this issue in light of the recent resurgence of capital to emerging markets. Although it remains unclear how long this resurgence will hold up if higher oil prices and other factors cause renewed risk aversion. My study broadly suggests that the strong policy presumption should be in favor of an open capital market. Even so, situations could arise where temporarily high capital inflows might constitute a bubble that causes overvaluation and problems down the road. Exchange rate intervention to limit excessive appreciation is one appropriate response. Whether taxation of income on foreign capital inflows should also be considered is a question of macro prudential management that goes beyond the main body of empirical literature that I've examined in my book. The IMF has recently proposed a series of policy tests that in effect state, get the other policies right, and if there's still an excessive inflow, consider some tax disincentive. One key test concerns whether the exchange rate is undervalued. Another, whether fiscal policy is balanced or in excessive deficit. One of the more prominent cases is Brazil. My impression is that chronic fiscal issues and an already high tax burden have led to tight monetary policy that keeps interest rates unduly high causing excessive capital inflows and currency appreciation under current international conditions. Even though, by the way, in 2009, the World Bank worried about Brazil's, quote, financing gap. Kristen Forbes will tell us more about the fund's evolving thinking on macro prudential capital measures. The main point, in my view, is that if tax and other disincentives are maintained on a continuous rather than a temporary countercyclical basis, they may sacrifice part of the potential gain from openness. <laughs>
For example, the work of Edwards, 1999, and Forbes, 2003, on the Chilean controls designed to avoid excessive short-term inflows suggests that one cost is a disproportionate cutback in capital available to small and medium firms. In short, care should be used in adopting fine-tuning for capital flow disincentives on macro prudential grounds. Thank you. Our analytics uh, were really designed around a system dynamics flow process where we looked at um, how things flow, where they flow, and, uh, and where they collect. The, it, it was also built on uh, some system of system capabilities. So um, we, we built it so that it could be modular. You could look at uh, how does the financial system integrate with the economic system, how does it, and how does it then in turn integrate with the markets itself. At, at the end of the modeling engagements, or throughout the modeling engagements, we bring a couple of things to the table. We're, we're able to really look at some of the tipping points that you'll see within an underlying financial system. Uh, some of the complex nonlinear flows, so the, the positive and negative feedback loops uh, that you'll see within a system, and to try and understand what shock absorbers could be implemented, either by an, uh, the central bank or by uh, some of the policy makers in terms of improving the underlying uh, economic structure of the, um, uh, of the economy. The, the purpose of this really, I think, is to uh, try and move from stability to resilience. So what, what, can, what can some of these countries and central bankers and emerging markets do, uh, do about that? Um, the, uh, our our four-step process really was um, you know, to perform some of the modeling to diagnose the issues, uh, refine those systemic uh, tipping points with uh, specific studies or uh, use, utilizing some econometric studies, and then um, to uh, try and understand what could be done to help close some of those fiscal and economic gaps within country. Um, some of our findings have been that um, the, it's, I like to use an analogy where you have uh, the, the developed countries and the um, sort of the larger emerging, the BRIC emerging market countries that are ocean liners and steam liners driving in the ocean versus the very small emerging market economies that are trying to row through the ocean and just deal with all of the waves that are occurring. So when you have situations like uh, Bernanke jamming down the, the, uh, the pile driver in the ocean and sending that wave of in inflation over, it, it, they're having to deal with that. It's an unenviable position for many of the smaller emerging market countries. So we're in the process right now as some of the larger developing countries. We just went through the process of exporting risk. We are now in the process of exporting some inflation, and these are all things that they're having to to manage uh, in some of the smaller developing or smaller emerging market economies. I think there's sort of a bifurcation that you're really seeing in these economies. The um, you're, you're seeing a, a the BRIC countries, which are don't don't want to be called emerging markets anymore. They, they've moved, they've grown beyond that. They still have some underlying structural and infra infrastructure issues. But they're, they're beyond emerging markets at this point. Uh, I don't know if we have a good name for it yet, but um, they are, uh, uh, there, there's a new state, I think. There's a, there's a fairly large paradigm shift that we're seeing right now. And the second group is the frontier economies. And those are the emerging markets that are still so small that they're just having to hang on to the roller coaster ride that we've had. Um, I'm going to. What I'm going to do, I'm actually going to sort of flip through the presentation a little bit faster because I know we uh, probably would like to get to the panel portion. Um, we, this this uh, just talks about some of the underlying capabilities, uh, how we deal with the system structuring, uh, the system of system components, and then ultimately the stock and flow diagrams you can see there on the right. Um, uh, ultimately, our focus really has been on central bankers and taking this to uh, the central bankers within the emerging markets so that they can understand policy perspectives from several different regulatory regimes, whether it's uh, the management of prompt corrective action, at what point do they step in to handle a failing bank, 
to emergency liquidity assistance, and what kind of liquidity uh, liquidity pushes can you see, and what what impact will it actually have on the economy? Uh, the bank failure resolution. Most very small emerging markets and emerging economies don't really have a, a strong capacity to take banks under. So while they keep have pride that they don't take banks under, it's also uh, it means that you still have these residual poorly performing assets within the system. Uh, we also try to help them with depositor and, and investor protection regimes, and then understanding what's in the bank and corporate debt restructuring. Very similar to what has happened recently <coughs> in, in Kazakhstan. I think it's uh, really a, a fascinating case study and what can be done to share in the losses. Uh, that, uh, many, many people told Kazakhstan that they just simply uh, they, they wouldn't come back. They, they, they could not distribute these losses within the banking system that the government needed to step up and take them on. And they face down those bankers, and uh, rightfully so, people are, are in fact coming back to invest in Kazakhstan. So um, yeah, very interesting in terms of the failure regimes and what can be done even in an environment that uh, does not have um, uh, a, a strong failure resolution regime. What, what we're showing here is some of the impacts, and I think sort of relatively um, small impacts from adjustments in PCA and emergency liquidity assistance. Uh, we are, are modeling diagram takes out the flows along the bottom in terms of number of days. So we have about a three-year projection. Um, and what we're looking at is the number of failed banks out of about a total of about 46 banks. Um, we have run a stress scenario on an underlying uh, emerging market Eastern Bloc country and looked at what would happen in terms of the number of failed banks in if you had an increase in prompt corrective action of around 4%. Uh, the, uh, by relative comparison, the U.S. has prompt corrective action in around the 2% range. Uh, you, you start to see implications for it around 4 or 5% because there are regulatory enforcement actions that happened before that. Um, in the emerging markets, it's much higher. They are generally more capital, be better capitalized than the U.S. or European counterparts, mainly because they have to be. There is a certain lack of underlying economic uh, infrastructure, for lack of a better term, that uh, many of these countries need and could use to help get the central banker beyond that need to ha maintain very, very high capital requirements. Um, you know, a, a strong pension system, uh, the enactment of very strong secondary mortgage markets or secondary markets to. Um, uh, enable assets to, to flow through, and a strong, um, strong bankruptcy regime can all be very much more important than some of the central bankers' roles in sort of helping the country uh, grow and manage within that environment. One of the other things that we do within the model is to like, take a look at some of the outputs. So what we've looked at here is the net level of new domestic lending. And it's, again, with the same, uh, the same environment, so a stressed environment. And we have um, the same scenarios with a um, reductions in prompt corrective action, a baseline number, and then effectively uh, reducing PCA to US or European levels and um, uh, providing a free flow of liquidity. Uh, what we found was, interestingly, the free flow of liquidity it has a very, very short duration impacts. You're, you're looking at maybe a year impact in terms of increases in lending, but uh, over the long term, you basically just uh, fall back to those uh, traditional levels uh, of lending that you would, you would be forecasting. So um, not quite as impactful as, as one would hope. Um, just, to, just to wrap up quickly so that we can get onto some questions, because I'm sure that there are a number of questions for all the speakers in here as we move to the next second stage of this. Um, we, I think we've um, uh, we, we found some, uh, from an international country flow perspective, um, the, uh, there's a number of things that emerging markets, and I like to call them the uh, sort of the larger brick, we all know those, uh, but the frontier economies, 
uh, a lot of things that they can do from both a central banker fiscal policy perspective, but also from an underlying economic infrastructure perspective to uh, prepare for this wave of influx of capital that, that Jeremy and others were, were referencing. Um, so uh, again, let me just go ahead and stop here, and I think that we'll move on to the next stage of the panel. So I've been given the unenviable task of trying to tie all these papers together and comment on them in about 12 minutes. <laughs> um, so some of you are probably wondering what these papers have in common, and I wondered the same when I was first asked to discuss the papers. But what I'm going to try to do is show you that actually they all, the papers are very nice complements to each other, and they can all be tied together in one coherent framework that makes some very important insights on how we should think about capital flows to emerging markets. So what I'm going to do first is tie these papers together and link it to some recent work at the IMF, which is very relevant to what was discussed here, and then talk about one important factor that I think is missing from the discussion so far. So first, how do all these papers link together? Um, to link them together, I think you need to start by just thinking about what's happened in the global economy. This is just a graph from the IMF's WIO update from January, which shows GDP growth around the world. The red is GDP growth in advanced economies, the blue is the world, and the orange is emerging and developing economies. And what the graph shows is what we all know. The world just went through a very serious recession, sharpest decline in growth since the Great Depression. But what stands out is how the advanced economies hit the sharpest decline in growth, and the, what this did to the advanced economies is basically move forward some severe fiscal challenges. Countries such as the UK, US, Japan, and most countries in the Eurozone all had imposing fiscal problems, but the, they weren't going to spiral into unsustainable situations for another 10, 15, 20 years. These were problem, medium-term problems that countries had to deal with, but they had time. What this crisis did, partly because of the slowdown in growth, the slowdown in tax revenues, and the spending that was undertaken to have the economies recover quickly, was that it made these medium and longer term fiscal problems become fiscal problems for today. So the developed world now has to undergo a major, or most countries in the developed world have to undergo major fiscal consolidations. That means that even though they've come out of the recession, that means that growth will be slower as they get their fiscal situations under control. Um, that also means that there will be a pressure to have looser monetary policy to help the country sustain growth and not slip back into another recession as they undergo different degrees of fiscal consolidation. The flip side of that is the orange, the emerging world. The emerging world came through the crisis without as big a slowdown. They emerged from the crisis without looming fiscal problems, without they some have some debt problems, but not nearly the immediate fiscal challenges that the developed world has. That means that coming out of this crisis, the emerging world is going to grow much faster, and it will not have to deal with these fiscal challenges and undergo fiscal consolidation. Instead, the challenge facing the emerging world is going to be growth potentially too strong. They're going to have to deal with inflation, risks of overheating, risks of bubbles. So they're going to have a leaning more towards higher interest rates to keep inflation under control and to prevent bubbles and overheating. So the world really has, to borrow from The Economist, turned upside down. Um, this is an Economist cover from in the fall. Um, it really is astounding. 10 years ago, when we talked about debt problems and fiscal challenges, who's going to have the next fiscal crisis, we just focused on emerging markets. It's pretty amazing to think all of our early warning models, we didn't even bother putting in the developed countries. We just had emerging markets in there. Um, now the biggest concerns about crisis, fiscal crises are in the developed world. Similarly, but 10 years ago or a decade ago, when we used to talk about capital flows to emerging markets, the discussion focused on there wasn't enough capital going in. The Lucas paradox. Why wasn't more capital going into emerging markets for productive investments? Now the debate has completely flipped, and we're more worried about too much capital going into emerging markets. How how do emerging markets handle the surges of capital coming in? And that leads to the challenge that was discussed most in the first presentation. There are, because of these shifts in the global economy, because of the higher growth in emerging markets, because of the higher interest rates you're likely to see in emerging markets as they handle, um, as they deal with overheating instead of slow growth, you're going to see a continuation of strong capital flows to emerging markets, a continuation of what we've seen this last year. And how do emerging markets handle this? They really have limited options, and no options are easy or ideal. One thing they could do as they're faced with the surges of capital coming in is lower interest rates, but that's not an attractive policy that could, if anything, make overheating worse, inflation worse, create more bubbles. 
Another option for the emerging world as they're flooded with capital is tighter fiscal policy. I think some countries do need to tighten the fiscal policy. That's going to be an important part of the solution. But this is hard politically. It's hard for many governments in the emerging world to say, we have to reduce our budget deficits when those deficits are smaller than in developed countries, when they have a lot of investment opportunities and in infrastructure, education that are pressing needs for the countries um, that, that might undermine growth in the future if they cut back in investment. When you talk to Brazil about uh, tighter fiscal policy, all you hear about is, but we're hosting the World Cup and the Olympics. We have to do that in investment. Um, so there are political challenges on many levels of doing tighter fiscal policy. So there's only limited room for that in many countries. Another option to handle the surges of capital inflows is let the exchange rates appreciate. I think that's going to have to be part of the solution, but there are some serious concerns that this will reduce the competitiveness of the country's exports, could lead to Dutch disease problems, and this is very, very scary for countries that have relied on exports for growth. Another option, do what China does, don't let the exchange rate appreciate very much and instead accumulate reserves. This has worked for some countries for a while, but now the cost is getting very, very high in many countries, especially as the cost of sterilization is going up as interest rates in many of these countries are increasing more relative to U.S. rates. So what's left? Oh, one other thing, you could also encourage capital outflows. Some countries are doing this. So if there's a lot of money coming in from abroad, you could balance that by making it easier for domestic investors to send money abroad. And that has, can help on the margin, but generally the pool of domestic investors is smaller than the amount of foreign capital coming in. Um, and it's also hard to tell your domestic investors, send your money out of here, even though our domestic prospects are great. Um, that's hard to accomplish. So that also only has limited effectiveness. So what do countries do? They're flooded with capital. What's left? You could do capital controls focused on capital inflows, and that was the focus of the second presentation. Does that make sense? Or you could do better risk management, better macroprudential regulation to handle the surges of capital coming into the country, and an example of that was the final presentation. So this is the situation many emerging markets find themselves in. They feel rather trapped. Suddenly a lot of capital is coming in. It's very hard to handle it. There's no attractive policy options to handle the surges of capital. And because of this frustration, there's been renewed push at the IMF to think about other options such as capital controls. So next I want to just quickly summarize what the, uh, the main lesson from the recent work coming out of the IMF. Um, don't worry, you're not expected to read the chart on the left. This is just up there for illustrative purposes. Um, but basically, the IMF has done a number of new studies looking at capital controls and whether that is an attractive option for countries worried about the surges of capital inflows. The key study that has gotten the most attention in this vein is the one listed on the top, Capital Inflows, the Role of Controls, by a set of authors at the IMF. And what the paper basically finds, or what's the key lesson that has been taken away from this paper, is the flowchart on the left. What that basically says is, if countries can make it through the flowchart and meet all of the conditions at each stage of the flowchart and make it from the top to the blue box at the bottom, then capital controls, controls on capital inflows, could be a, an attractive policy option to deal with surges of capital flows. Um, basically, what the two sides of that flowchart boil down to is that the only countries that basically might qualify to use capital controls are first countries that has concerns about over-borrowing and credit booms, but prudential regulations are insufficient to handle the results of this over-borrowing and flood of credit. Or the second path to being sort of allowed to use capital um, controls is that if you have an overvalued exchange rate, um, more reserve accumulation is undesirable, you're worried about inflation, and fiscal policy is insufficient to handle all that. So that's a pretty hefty set of criteria to meet in order to qualify to potentially use capital controls. So I think this paper has been somewhat misinterpreted. Some people read it as saying, the IMF now says you can go out and use capital controls and that's a, a justified policy. That's not what the paper says. The paper instead, I think, does provide a very good public service if interpreted correctly. It basically lays out the theoretical conditions when capital controls might be justified. If you don't meet these criteria, you shouldn't be talking about capital controls. Other options are more desirable. But then the question comes, but then I have several concerns with how this has been interpreted. Um, so the first, so I think this is a, a very useful start. It does lay out the issues. It does lay out the circumstances when capital controls are a viable option. But there are a few key points missing from this study. And this is where some of the discussion today is very helpful in informing us what is missing from what the IMF has been saying. The first issue is that what the IMF lays out 
is that capital controls, if you meet all those qualifications, are only viable as a temporary response to a temporary surge in inflows. That, to be fair, the authors in the IMF study do say this in the text, but it isn't in the flowchart and it's largely been ignored by people reading the paper. The IMF is very clear. These only work in temporary situations of temporary surges of capital inflows. And what we learned in the first presentation is this is not a temporary situation. This is a permanent shift in the global economy. The global economy turned upside down, that picture I just showed you. Capital inflows are likely to continue at these strong rates into emerging markets for an extended period. So that does question whether the capital controls would be effective at all. This is not a temporary situation. The second issue is that although the IMF approach develops theoretical scenarios when capital controls could make sense, they don't do a good job analyzing the costs and benefits. What they do is just say, in, these are the scenarios when you might think about capital controls, but again, doesn't tell you exactly what the costs and benefits are. And this is where the Klein analysis, the second presentation, fills a very important gap. This is the only um, analysis I've seen where, they really, where he really tries to quantify the costs and benefits of capital controls and capital account liberalization. Um, I can't recommend this study enough for those of you interested in the topic. It is a very thorough, thorough review of hundreds of papers on this topic, and it really ties them together and tries to find the real message amidst all the noise of all these different studies. Um, but the, what the result from the study is, which I think is very important, is that the cost to growth of reducing financial globalization, basically of capital controls, do not seem to outweigh the benefit of reduced risk from crises. So this does question the, the key concept underlying the IMF supporting capital controls. Even if countries meet the circumstances where capital controls might be desirable, it's still not clear that the benefits would outweigh the costs. And I think the Klein study says we have to think about that very carefully and really dig a little deeper to explain why in any circumstances that, that the benefits of the controls might outweigh the costs, because it doesn't appear to do so in the literature he has surveyed. And then finally, I think the strongest case for capital controls that you can make is that it would be, to, and based on the empirical evidence, based on the studies, is that capital controls can be useful in shifting the structure of borrowing of countries away from riskier liabilities to safer borrowing. For example, it has been shown in Chile to shift borrowing more towards long-term debt structures and away from short-term debt structures, which could over time make a country less vulnerable. But if that is really the main goal of capital controls, is to change the borrowing structure, change the liability structure, why can't that be done through macroprudential regulation? Why do you have to use capital controls, which have all sorts of pervasive costs and all sorts of side effects, a very blunt instrument? Instead, why don't you go right to the problem you're trying to address, the structure of borrowing and liabilities? Why can't you just do that directly through regulation? regulation? And that's why I think the last presentation presents one alternative, the type of things government or governments, countries, um, regulators should be thinking about instead of using the blunt tool of capital controls. So what's missing from all that? I think there is one very important factor, issue missing from all the discussions so far, and I just want to put it on the table, and maybe it will be on the list of the next set of conference, or the next conference on capital controls or capital flows. So I think what's missing is more discussion of what is going on by domestic investors. Looking more at gross capital flows, inflows and outflows, outflows by domestic investors versus outflows and inflows by foreign investors, instead of focusing mostly on net capital flows. So more specifically, here's an example from Thailand. The black line shows gross inflows, capital inflows into Thailand. This is largely inflows by foreigners. The red line shows basically domestic outflows, um, investment by domestic citizens in Thailand. And most analyses of capital flows, pretty much all of the empirical work um, surveyed in the Klein paper, um, mostly all analysis worrying about sudden stops of capital flow, all analyses of any type, pretty much just focus on net flows into countries, which is the sum of the gross inflows and the gross outflows. Oh, and just the gross outflows, the red line, it's reported using balance of payments convention, so a negative sign means a positive gross outflow. So on the right, that is when Thai investors started to send more money abroad. Um, but basically in the past, people looked at net flows into countries, and they basically interpreted the, that as saying what foreigners were doing. And this shows why that interpretation was pretty fair until recently. Um, most of the capital inflows and outflows in Thailand were driven by the black line, by the foreigners. 
what domestic citizens were doing, the red line, was pretty small. So you could pretty much ignore what domestic citizens were doing and just focus on what the foreigners were doing. And that told you about net flows in and out of a country, which is what you care about for things like currency appreciation, pressures on interest rate bubbles, et cetera. But what's changed dramatically in the last decade is that more and more countries have lifted their controls on capital outflows, and more and more domestic citizens in an emerging markets are sending money abroad and bringing money back home and trading more. So now the red line, the investments largely by Thai citizens, have grown much more in importance. And in some, some periods, what is happening domestically with domestic investors is actually overshadowing what is even happening on the foreign capital flows, the black line. And so more and more, I think we need to separate this out and think about what are foreigners doing versus what domestic citizens are doing. Because sometimes the actions by domestic investors in these countries can totally compensate for and even overwhelm what foreigners are doing. And this leads to very different policy implications. If, say, surges of capital in a country are driven by domestic citizens, not foreigners sending money in and out, that does question how, what capital controls are doing, if they'll be effective. Um, and here's just one example of how this splitting capital flows into domestic versus foreign investors can completely change your interpretation of what's going on in a country. So this is capital flows for Chile. And the black line is net capital flows to Chile, which is what most people focus on. And during the crisis in 08, there was actually a surge of capital coming into Chile, a boom of capital coming into Chile. This is most emerging markets saw capital flee and were worried about a shortage of capital during the crisis. Chile hit the opposite problem initially. It hit a boom of capital coming into the country, that black line. But what happened? The green line is foreign investors, and foreigners largely pulled their money out of Chile, as they did in most emerging markets during the crisis. But the red line at the bottom is what domestic institutions and investors in Chile did. Domestic citizens in Chile largely sold the foreign investments and brought back a large amount of money into Chile. And that net inflow into Chile by domestic investors outweighed the fact that foreigners were pulling money out of the country. So Chile got a boom of capital instead of seeing a, a sudden stop as in many other emerging markets. So I think that's just a neat example to show that now that capital inflows and outflows are much larger, now that domestic investors in many of these emerging markets are playing a much more active role, any analysis of global capital flows, I think we need to break it out. Look at what foreigners are doing. Look at what domestic citizens are doing. And then when we think about policy options, we should think about how those options affect both sets of investors. And suddenly limiting con controls on capital inflows may not be that effective if it's your domestic citizens pulling money in and out. So to conclude, the global economy has undergone a major transformation in the patterns of global capital flows. We saw that clearly in the first presentation. This is a permanent shift and therefore policies aimed at temporary relief from capital coming into countries will not be satisfa satisfactory. Emerging economies must choose between difficult options. The criteria to justify controls on capital inflows outlined by the IMF are very lengthy, and then it's still unclear if the benefits of capital controls outweigh the costs, as shown in the Klein presentation. And most of the benefits of capital controls can be achieved more efficiently through prudential regulations without many of the additional costs. An example of that we saw in the third presentation. So, and finally, I think any future discussion of this, I hope, will also be extended to consider the role and policy implications for capital flows by foreigners and domestic citizens, not just focusing on actions by foreigners. Thank you. You got a lot of analysis, a lot of data, a lot of details. Uh, I'm delighted that the crowd has stayed with it, and I'm sure that uh, tees us up for some very interesting discussion. So the floor is open. I'm going to ask a question myself, but I want to wait until one of the slides comes back on. So the floor is open and uh, far away. Let me ask each of you to go to the standing mic. Or do we have a traveling mic today? Yeah. So go to the standing mic and identify yourself and far away. Hi. My name is Michael Klein. I work at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and these questions in no way reflect uh, the view of the U.S. Treasury. Um, it may not reflect my views either, but um, this is a very interesting set of issues, and I think it's a very important set of issues because it's one where there's a lot of fluidity about views. So it really opens up um, a, a set of issues where we'll see policy changes over the um, next few years. And as I was listening to um, the presentations today, a few things occurred to me I'd be interested in the panelists um, view of this. One um, issue is almost an issue of definition. That is, 
And when you think about um, the studies about capital account openness and growth, that's about countries typically that tend to have either open capital accounts or don't, and historically have had open capital accounts or not, as opposed to capital account controls that are more episodic. So there's a real distinction between a country that you know, didn't have capital accounts open at all and countries that uh, attempt to stop a surge of inflows. I think that's an important distinction. In a lot of the studies, the cross-country regression studies, what you find is there are almost no instances of opening capital accounts and then closing them again. But what we've seen lately are efforts to try to um, stop capital from flowing in. But it's, you know, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's hard to um, <coughs> put it back in. Um, another issue is the efficacy of controls. And this relates to that same point. It's easier to keep money out of China because they never had capital account controls. But countries like Brazil that had open financial accounts and then tried to close them, they found that they had to put in place ever widening sets of controls with ever increasing sets of inefficiencies. So again, I think there's, this also points to that important distinction between episodic controls and long-standing uh, blocking of controls. Um, I like Kristen's point about, I thought that was a very interesting point about outflows and inflows. And one reason that's really important is the definition of capital controls isn't straightforward. If you, I've tried to do this, if you make like a Venn diagram of macroprudential and capital controls, it's not clear what you mean by capital controls. It can be based upon the currency of denomination or residency. Kristen points out really importantly how the residency becomes a very complicated thing. And macro prudential sounds good, capital controls sound bad, but it's not clear really what the distinction is uh, between them. Um, one other point, uh, another point is that um, about whether or not controls are warranted. One point that, you know, you referred, Kristen, to the Austria Al study. Um, one of the key points there is if countries already have an undervalued or overvalued exchange rate, whatever that means. Although in this building, I guess we know well what that means. Um, we can nail it down to the last you want. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, so then you'll be able to, to uh, speak of that. But whether or not the controls are really trying to impede adjustment or not, because there are times when an appreciation would be warranted. Um, and finally, um, just uh, a more personal, uh, well, two points. Um, one is in Edison at Al 2004. I'm Al, or one of Al's. Um, so I think there's a somewhat of a mischaracterization of that. The key result from that is not that if you include government um, uh, reputation, the results fall apart. We were just mimicking what Danny Roderick had done. But the key result is that, and, and I continue to believe this is true, that the effects of capital account liberalization not episodic, but sort of opening up more generally, I think are very context dependent. And that's true if you use these uh, measures of institutional quality, but they don't vary over time. So it's also true if you just use initial levels of income. And I think there are reasons to think that very, very poor countries might not have the infrastructure to mediate capital control as well. Very rich countries sort of don't need it so much. It's the countries in the middle for which it's really important. And just one uh, last point, which is a little bit of a nitpicking point, I guess, but when medicine does meta-analyses, what they do is they have lots of different populations or, or, or studies drawn from lots of different populations all over the country, whereas when people in economics do meta-analyses, sometimes it's the same data that you're attacking with different tools. So it's, I think, in some ways distinct from sort of an idea where you have, you know, in Rochester, Minnesota, and in Rochester, New York, and in Tampa, Florida, and you have all these things on drug efficacy, they're very different studies, and then you sort of draw inference from distinct studies as opposed to having cross-country growth regressions and drawing inference from the same data set, but you're, you know, it's been addressed in, uh, in different studies. So um, I'd like to give the other panelists a chance to have some time for that. All right, well, that's a, a, a lengthy list. Uh, which of my colleagues would like to respond to which pieces of it? Bill, go ahead. Why don't I focus on the, the specific uh, things in the Edison, Edison Klein and also the, the meta analysis and ask Kristen to say something about perhaps or others about the episodic versus. Uh, but 
my interpretation was that the, the study you and, and, and Hallie and a couple of others did was relied on heavily by the fund, by the COES, I think it was COES, survey uh, as sort of showing that this literature is not robust. Uh, well, okay, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, that. That was all I was trying to say, and it seemed to me that the, the government reputation is sort of the deus ex machina in, in most of this international growth uh, literature has, has never persuaded me, and I was uh, interested to find that I could demonstrate that the growth does, that, that it responds to growth, uh, making uh, one appropriately suspicious. Um, on the question of meta-analysis, I try to address that a little bit in the book, and there's some language in there. My sense is that there is enough difference in the variables that are chosen, in the years that are chosen, in the methods that are chosen, that in some sense it's, it's somewhat similar to having a different population, to adding Iowa to, to Florida instead of just doing uh, additional tests uh, on, on Florida. I, I do think that the other disciplines seem to be further along than I think economists tend to be in trying to sort of get an ensemble of truth from all the evidence. And the economists seem to be stuck on this one-upmanship and it's either got to be one or it's got to be the opposite. And it's not too surprising that the public, general public thinks economists can never agree on anything. So I think there is a lot of value to be mined by, by looking at meta-analysis and doing it in a fashion a little bit more similar to what some of the uh, other disciplines are doing with it. Okay. Could I comment on, on sure, that? Sure, one way of thinking about this issue is actually through the prism of program evaluation, right? Because, I mean, so if you, if you were to compare, say, this literature to the development economics literature, which over the last 10 or 15 years has increasingly moved in the direction of looking at trying to analyse specific policy interventions and their impact through, rather than through cross-country sort of studies, but much more through natural experiments and the like. And I think actually this is a literature that will increasingly benefit from more of that type of analysis. Because when you compare, say, economics to medicine or psychology, natural experiments are a much more important part of, of that sort of policy of, or that evaluation toolkit and therefore of the meta-analysis that's undertaken and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I, I would like to see the literature in this area you know, address cost benefit in the same way as actually the MIT, you know, Poverty Action Lab, right? I mean, that's the bread and butter of what that institution, uh, you know, it does. And, and, and I think this is actually a fertile area in, 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 in sort of financial development and looking at particular interventions of whether they be controls or otherwise. So, Michael, I agree with pretty much everything you said, so I won't repeat most of it, but let me build on two of the points you made. One is, I agree, it is important to differentiate between um, capital controls that are put on in countries that had largely open capital accounts and they're just meant for a short period of time and then lifted. That is probably going to be a different type of analysis than countries that have been closed for a while versus open for a while. Um, and that also makes me, well, that makes me worry about a couple things. One is that's not what we're talking about today. Even though countries phrase capital controls as just a short-term measure, back to my main point that is up there, I don't think this is a short-term surge of capital. This is a long-term surge. So we shouldn't be talking in those terms. Um, another issue related to that is that makes me worry more because some of the people finding support for capital controls claim that, that com um, they don't focus on the episodic episodes. There the evidence is even weaker. And then we do have a couple episodes people have looked at. Malaysia was one example where they put on capital. And there there's the, the empirical evidence is completely useless. There, there's just not enough there to go off of. And there's no results. The one episode that people have looked at, and there's the whole literature that you know, is the Chilean capital controls, the Incaje. And there we do have a nice case of a country that had an open capital account put on the Incaje from about 91 to 98 and then lifted it. So what was the effect? Lots of studies. In my reading of that literature is that the studies found they had pretty much no effect. Um, they didn't stem the appreciation of the currency. They didn't reduce vulnerability to crises. Um, pretty much the only effect they find is that it lengthened the liability of borrowing. So borrowing is more long-term than short-term. Um, but that gets back to if you want to accomplish that goal, you should do more macroprudential regulation, not capital controls. So if anything, the, epi the only evidence we really have on the episodic use of capital controls weakens the case for them. 
Um, and then that goes to the one other thing I want to comment on is you make this very good point is it is a fine line between what is a capital control and what is macro prudential regulation. I completely agree. Some, some policies could be called both. Um, and some of it's just how you sell it as a policymaker, to be honest. And I, I ran into that when I was in Peru a couple months ago, where the head of the Central Bank of Peru said that it's actually illegal in Peru to use capital controls. But they have not been shy, but they just call them all macroprudential regulations and accomplish the same goals. Bill. I want, I want to join the issue on this question that it's a new world out there and this is a sea of capital. If you look at uh, Jeremy's first slide, uh, you know, what they're projecting is 4.5% four, of GDP. That's exactly where it was in 2003, 2004. So I mean, I think that we need to be a little bit careful. Also, as his slide showed, you know, despite all the complaints about appreciating currencies, there hasn't been that much appreciation from the level before the crisis. So maybe we need to think a little bit about whether we're in a brave new world of much more massive capital flows. I mean, I, I, I grant you that given all the structural stuff and, and the incorporation of these assets, one could expect that, but these economies are growing so much to the base against which that amount is set. I mean, we're talking about uh, still a considerably smaller amount than occurred in, in, 2000, uh, in 2007. Uh, and the base uh, against which the GDP base is growing is, is, is increasing. So I think just to kind of a, a bit of a caveat that it's, it may not be as radical a, a shift uh, as, as has been suggested. Yeah, um, I think that's a very important point. I mean, you know, what we were trying to in part get it in the, in the recent report was to put some of these things in perspective. And this actually doubles tails with, with some of Kristen's comments, which, I mean, so our study looks at capital inflows in part because that's just the historical basis of, of, of that particular analysis. But aggregate capital outflows from emerging markets are larger than aggregate inflows into emerging markets. In fact, emerging markets have been accumulating foreign assets over the past 10 years in aggregate. And obviously China is partly, you know, you know, is a big part of that through public sort of, you know, reserve accumulation, but that's not the whole story. And so you're exactly right that both sides would have to be looked at. And then if you look at the domestic side, I mean, so people might focus on, oh, look at, look at foreign lending into, into this country, and, you know, it is something that needs to be examined. However, in most emerging markets, domestic credit growth from domestic sources is considerably larger and often more rapid than the than the credit growth sourced from the foreign sector, and so you need to look at them jointly, not separately. Or you you know, looking at just the foreign side of it means you're missing part of the big picture. Okay, Mike. My name is Michael Gadbo. I'm with Georgetown Law Center. Uh, my question has to do with what this economic policy and analysis tells us about the nature of regulations um, and to what extent uh, does openness uh, correlate with deregulation. And I start with uh, Bill Klein's comparison to the trade area. Uh, it's certainly true that measures at the border can easily be looked at in terms of uh, deregulation and free trade. But an awful lot of the work of the last 30 years has really been done on technical barriers to trade, non-tariff barriers, where um, it's not so much a matter of, of uh, uh, freeing it up as much as it is getting the right balance in regulation between uh, openness and things like consumer protection, et cetera. Similarly, in the financial area, uh, the microprudential measures, for example, which seems to be uh, more important uh, to creating uh, really appropriate capital flows, uh, are much more important and don't necessarily lend themselves to um, easy characterizations between whether they lead to openness or lack of openness. So my question is, um, uh, how far have we gotten uh, in this uh, appreciation that the markets uh, don't answer every question with respect to financial regulation. Um, 
uh, and uh, how much do we know about uh, what is really good regulation in the financial area, and does the trade analogy tell us anything uh, about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> so the, um, you know, I think you talked about uh, degree of openness and deregulation, um, and I, one of the things that I'd like to uh, focus on. You're saying how far have we gotten? Uh, with regards to regulation, I think we're, um, depending on the country, I think uh, we're either very, very, uh, in the very, very beginning, I think, of uh, how, we, how far countries have gotten. I think uh, it, when we look at the relative spectrum of how central, central banks manage the, um, uh, their capital controls and macroprudential regulation, to put sort of inflation controls at the far end, uh, sort of the more mature, the best practices in how you manage these things. I think only about 27 countries now actually utilize some level of inflation controls. Most other countries are sort of coming along in their capacity and building their capacity to manage some of these risks that are coming in much faster, honestly, than the regulations are adjusting to them. Uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to say about sort of the you know, term capital controls versus macro uh, prudential regulation is that the, the one part of that term that I really sort of react to is control, because right? I think it's really the illusion of control. The, um, there's a lot of discussion, everyone loves talking about China and, and the management of their, uh, their currency. Uh, what I think people are missing is some of the unintended consequences. Uh, w one thing that will happen in an environment where you have excessive currency controls is you risk black markets and other unintended consequences cropping up, and the introduction of those other unintended consequences can actually reduce controls for some of these countries. So I think that the, um, the illusion of control is, can be a very dangerous thing for some of these regulators. Yep. Let me just come in on the, on the re regulation versus uh, controls. I mean, I remember being in Italy and seeing posters at the, at, the, at the airport. This will reveal how old I am. It is illegal to take currency out of the country, you know. Uh, or, you know, some places a ton, sometimes you could be shot if you had foreign currency. Or, you know, there was, that's a, that's a control, you know. That's a, it, it, it's not a regulation. <laughs> now, in contrast, when you pick up the paper and it said, ah, oh, Koreans are putting on capital controls. And you look at the fine print. And apparently it's increasing the down payment you have to make in order to make a leveraged bet, a hedge, or, or, or a, to take a short position on dollars. And it's just very bizarre sort of derivative stuff. Okay, point one. So I, I think that what's being looked at first and foremost by the more, more sophisticated emerging markets is precisely its regulatory common sense stuff. It, it should also be said that we are in no position to talk about regulatory design. Uh, after the Great Recession, where essentially the massive series of failures on, on regulation were a critical contribution to, to the problem. But I, I mean, I think you know it when you see it as to whether it's sort of a prudential uh, improvement or, an, at the end of the day, an outright or very strong impediment to either taking your money out or, or bringing, it, bringing it in. Okay, yes, right here. Hi, uh, my name is James Bilodeau. I uh, manage our emerging markets finance work at the World Economic Forum. Um, just had a, a question related to some work we do on financial system development. Um, so by some accounts, um, a, a lot of the success in countries such as China and elsewhere could be seen as a response to recent crises as opposed to long-term structural change or development of their financial systems. We could, uh, someone might say that China, um, there might be some things going on now where a lot of the lending that's happened is, is relatively untransparent, uh, perhaps not even collateralized. Uh, India still uh, needs some work developing its local bond markets. Um, if the growth in flows we see in emerging markets is not accompanied by a true trend um, in improvement of the, the structure of financial systems in these countries, the capacity to, to sort of manage these funds, uh, is this going to be one of the, the biggest problems that we're going to face, and what are your thoughts on that? 
JW? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an enormous challenge. I think that you are, um, without the underlying infrastructure, um, when the flows come in, the question is what happens to them. And um, if, you, if you don't have a strong pension system, if you don't have a strong secondary market, if you don't have capacities for flows to actually occur within country, then flows coming into the country you know, have very difficult times sort of moving in throughout the country and then moving back out. And it's, uh, there's, when you have substantial frictions like that, um, it uh, creates, it's more, there's much more costly um, and it is uh, more challenging to sort of manage the situation for all parties involved, whether it's external uh, influencers, external investors coming into the country or uh, the regulators in the country or the people, internal domestic investors. I, mean, I, I guess another way of stating that is that financial development and financial openness aren't the same thing, although they can often be correlated with each other. And so financial development, which has a whole bunch of enabling um, you know, policy and non-policy things that need to be done in, certain, in, in different economies, is an important way in which you can ensure that as funds come in, it's likely to be dispersed in an efficient way. And that's, after all, what you want, right? It's a capital allocation issue and making sure you don't have capital misallocation. And, and and that's the concern. I think the danger of focusing too much on controls is that often the issue is not just the the uh, the allocation of foreign capital, it's allocation generally of capital within particular countries and not being allocated sort of efficiently. Uh, and if you focus on too much on one, you really miss this bigger picture, which is that it's generally it's, it's not occurring in the most efficient way. Yeah. 